Hi everyone, it's great to see you and had a few little chats with a few of you previous to starting our Communication with School, Building a Foundation for Partnerships website. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous people of the lands and more specifically the Kwandamooka people where Lindy and I, the two hosts, are sitting at the moment and the past, present and future leaders. So Lindy's got control of our slideshow here and she's gonna to move to our overview. So this is just me saying, this is what we're going to be looking at in this, in this hour together. So we'll do a very brief review of that inclusive education. I'm sure most of you feel quite familiar with the what and the why, but we'll just talk a little bit more about that. The legislation and framework, which does support your engagement and your consultation and, uh, as parents with the schools. The importance of building that collaborative relationship few different communication and advocacy tips and remembering our vision and those of you who've worked with who've come along to crew workshops will know exactly what we're talking about and we will highlight a little bit for those who haven't been to a crew workshop about a vision and building those skills as a parent advocate and finally we'll do a little bit on goal setting for inclusion and partnership and then we'll move on to any questions that have come through the chat line. So Lindy's going to talk about crew now. Yes, yeah, so, so I've been um, yeah, doing the home learning. I have four children in my house at the moment, three of them still doing school. Um, I came across Crew uh, because of my own daughter with a disability um, back in 2015 when the, um, the schooling was going off the rails. Um, and uh, basically our lives have, have, yeah, have, have changed dramatically um, since uh, learning a lot through Crew and um, Crew has been working for over 30 years in um, supporting the development of leadership and authentic change um, and enhancing the possibilities for people with disabilities to, to belong to and participate in community life. And I really enjoy being a part of this project that's now been running for nearly 12 months. Um, it is designed to help families of students with disability uh, be clear, informed, confident and connected, to work as respected and valued partners and advocates. We were going to 15 different places in Queensland, which was wonderful up until we couldn't do that anymore. So now we're, we're doing this more in an online space until workshops are able to happen more face to face. Uh, we also have individual consultations available with myself and the other consultants. We've been developing resources, which we've been spending a lot of this um, at home time doing, um, developing case studies and some really great web resources. So we're hoping to have that up very, very soon. And, um, and we are also uh, working on supporting peer support networks to uh, establish and grow. So uh, across the, the state. So that's actually getting... Um, parents who are keen to support other parents um, to connect with each other and, and resourcing them to do that. So a brief overview. So we're all back to um, the, the same place. Uh, we covered this a lot in workshop one, um, which we managed to deliver everywhere and that we wanted to. And it's also covered quite a bit in the first webinar in October. That's actually recorded and available on our site. Uh, but to, to bring us all up to speed. First of all, we include our children. I certainly include my daughter. Um, firstly, because it's her human right. Uh, so in 2016, the United Nations released general comment number four um, on article 24, declaring it is the right of every child to have an inclusive education. They defined what this looked like, and we will discuss that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, but basically, it is the means um, to which all people achieve all human rights. So therefore, a good education gets you um, a better chance of, of not living in poverty, of, of achieving financial equity and independence and so forth. So that's really important. Um, alongside that, there is 50 years of evidence. Um, not one study supports segregation, um, but 50 years of research shows uh, great social outcomes, academic outcomes, um, long-term benefits for independence, employment, um, all of those factors um, for students with disability, um, as well as students without. Uh, Non-disabled peers have been found to develop fantastic personal ethics, uh, 
a, a, a reduced fear of difference, of course, because they're growing up with um, children who have disability um, and just view that as part of normal life um, and go on to be able to employ or be employed by or work with um, people with disability in a variety of, of impairments with no um, with no, you know, personal mind block about it. So um, that's really important. And it's certainly why I'm very excited about inclusive education, because I have four children, only one of them has a disability. So it is a, a great value of ours to make sure that all of our children are experiencing inclusive education for those benefits. It's also supported by law here in Australia. We have the Disability Discrimination Act and the Disability Standards for Education outline how that should look from the start of schooling right up to the end of tertiary education. So uh, it, is, um, it is a law. So this is how inclusive education looks like, um, and it is defined like this uh, by the United Nations. Uh, inclusion is, there is a, a definite physical ratio aspect to it of a one in five or 20% of uh, classroom um, of students actually having uh, disabilities or learning difficulties, but it also is about social inclusion, um, about actually being involved actively in the classroom curriculum, um, not just simply sitting parallel, um, not being off uh, with other peers who also have disabilities and impairments, which we would call streaming. Um, it's actually being fully involved in authentic learner, uh, meaningful experience in the classroom. Um, just to very quickly recap, because we do cover this a lot um, and people who've been to workshop one would already have seen this, but exclusion obviously can occur in a macro or micro form. So um, you can be uh, experienced micro exclusions like from um, uh, camps, um, not being able to be allowed in the lunch um, time playground or um, be excluded from assessments, that sort of thing. Integration is where children with disability are put in mainstream classrooms but aren't actually given the supports and adjustments they require to be comfortable and to be actually actively learning um, where they're at in the content um, that the curriculum is trying to deliver at the time. So um, integration is basically putting students in a place but making no adjustments, if that makes sense. Segregation is very much the grouping and congregating sort of idea where children with disabilities or learning difficulties are placed together um, separately to their peers. And that can be done academically, socially, um, and obviously physically. Um, in Australia, we often call segregation uh, with the word special. So um, you can see how that sort of um, is illustrated there. Next, we're going to very briefly look at the features of an inclusive classroom. But again, um, this is there's a lot of resources on our website now. We have two sections about, first of all, about using your vision as a parent to pursue an inclusive education. But second of all, also what, what is inclusive education? We have videos, articles, a whole variety of um, resources there. So um, I encourage you to explore it. If you have problems finding it, don't hesitate to give crew a, a ring. We will certainly help you find it. Um, but it is very much about the teacher taking responsibility for learning. Um, an aspect of be, being socially isolated would be uh, having a full-time teacher aid. Um, that can be very socially isolating for a student. Uh, so that's a very um, important uh, key part and that's what the, the United Nations has actually uh, uh, spoken about that. Um, having high expectations, so not a focus on life skills, but an actual authentic meaningful education for every child, regardless of um, nature of disability or, or that sort of thing. Um, reasonable adjustments need to be provided as much as needed. Um, UDL is the Universal Design for Learning and that is actually stipulated by the United Nations as well. Um, differentiation is something that is more, uh, w uh, um, uh, teachers are more aware of the word differentiation in Australia and that's certainly part of um, their professional standards to be able to differentiate for all in their classroom. Um, I think we'll move on now to why we need a webinar on communication and collaboration with school. So 
Uh, this is a great quote from a past parent advocate. Um, their child would be out of school by now, but I think this would mirror a lot of um, current experiences by parents. So she says, attended many, many meetings to keep my daughter in the classroom with her peers, participating in regular curriculum, felt at times angry, frustrated, determined, focused, helpless, thrilled, on guard most of the time. So we're going to move on to the Disability Standards for Education. Um, and after this, uh, Fiona will take us through and just summarise. Okay, so this was developed out of the Disability Discrimination Act, which came out in 2005. And then in 2006, the standards had emerged. And 2015, they were actually reviewed again. So within them, they have five core areas that are really important in regards to education. So when we see enrolment, it means that every child has the same right as any other child to enrol at their local school, their local state school, and, and even within other departments, there's other schooling systems as well. So if you went to a school and the principal's going, oh no, there's a better school down the road and your children are going to this school, you have every right for your child to attend the school. Participation as well. So it's not only being there, as Lindy said before, it's actually participating. And, and that may, it, it is a part of the sporting program, participating in any other services that are happening within the school, whether there's a concert on. So equal rights within that. And based on the fact that reasonable adjustments are made so every student can attend or participate in a way that is alongside their peers. The services that are available, this is within the school and, and, and the broader community as well, but ensuring that your child has the same access to, every, to the service as every other child. The elimination of harassment and victimisation, so of course every child has the same rights there. And finally, the curriculum development, accreditation and delivery. So the standards within this means that your child has the right, has the access to to their education alongside their peers at the same age level as your particular child. So there's a lot of adjustments that are able to be made in this, in this specific area. And unfortunately, um, academic is, seems to be um, one of the, what could I say, the, the blocks that can stall a lot of parents. They think their children are missing out because they're not working alongside their peers. They're getting taken out of classes to catch up on things. They've got the teacher aid Velcros to them. That's not what we mean. What we mean is that they're able, the teachers are differentiating and using some of those UDL principles to ensure that you, the education of your child, your, well, your child's sitting alongside the next child and that you're all learning together. So Lindy said a little bit earlier, and I didn't introduce us both, but how she's a mother of four with three children learning online at the moment, whereas my background is actually in education. So I've been working in the education system up until about three years ago um, in various roles. So now we're looking at the parent and community engagement framework. So this has been developed by Education Queensland. And it is um, based on these areas of communication, partnerships, communi community collaboration, school culture and decision making. So what the department realises is the best thing for any child is to have the parents and students working together so they are able to um, ensure that the best education happens for that child. So within communication, it's, an, it's, that, um, it's not just talking at each other, but it's that effective communication. And we're gonna show you some, give you some ideas about that a little later on. The partnerships with parents. So the partnership's not just you going and working at the tuck shop necessarily, it's your involvement with the school in the sense of your child's learning. So having an understanding what your child is learning, having the teachers being able to communicate openly with you. And I'm sure that as we've gone through this last period with um, isolation and, on, and learning online, that there's needed to be even more participation from the school to work in partnership with you and you work in partnership with the school. So we'll talk some more about that. The community collaboration, that's that wider spectrum of, um, of support around the child and how important that is. 
the school culture. And as we all know, as soon as we walk into a school, we can feel what that culture is like. We can see if it's inclusive. We can um, ensure that where our child is going to be in a part of this school, that they're going to not be standing out as someone different and strange, but a, another student within the school. So I always find it interesting within this little um, diagram that advancing partnerships is where the Department of Education wants to go to ensure that we have inclusive practices for all schools, all children in our schools. So I'm gonna hand it over to Lindy again now, who's going to talk you through a collaborative relationship. So we know that um, at a federal level, we are required um, to be, there's an expectation of consultation um, with schools in, in uh, deciding what supports and adjustments are gonna be put in place for children. Um, and we can also see at a state level that there is that provided also in the parent and community engagement framework. So a really good place to start is thinking of what we're aiming for, which is a, a good collaborative relationship where everyone in the relationship is feeling valued. So think of relationships that you have in your life where you do feel like a valued partner. And can you start just throwing those ideas into the chat function right now? And Fiona will start picking out a few and reading them out for us. So what does it look like and what does it feel like to be a valued partner in a relationship? This could be work relationships, um, more, you know, friendship relationships, other things. Yeah, and there's some great ones coming through already. So um, Sue was talking about being listened to, uh, and then Carly's mentioned mutual respect. Yeah, feeling like they're trying to understand even if they don't agree. It's a good point. Uh, seeing that actions are coming from listening. Yes, and that's listening for, to you. So what you need to do is when you are presenting information that you actually validate what they're saying by saying, so do you understand what I mean? And getting them to repeat back to you what your expectation is there. Um, uh, yes, not being judged, of course, is very important. And that works both ways from the teacher's and the parent's point of view. And I guess I, I, the why I highlighted I come from education because I wanna give that side of it as well. Um, not questioning my parent, but hearing about my child, not me. And exactly. And as teachers, they get told that constantly. Unfortunately, in some, as in any group of people, you've got a diversity of people out there. But if you feel like they're questioning your parenting, you need to, if you feel confident enough to either pull them up on that or to be able to say, look, I don't think you're hearing what I'm saying. I'm just concerned about my child now. Can we put my child in the center of this conversation? So it's not about any judgment about parenting. Uh, another good one, no assumptions on parents' motives. Yes, keeping them and them keeping me in the loop. Oh yeah, communication again, so very, very important. So in that regard, you need to enable them to know what the best form of communication is. Is it texting? Is it phoning? In, in primary schools, often we have communication booklets, but with high schools, the children are expected to write in diaries more often. So working out what is the best way for you to be kept in the loop. Working together to find a solution to a problem that has a child's best interest at heart. Exactly. I don't need to say anything to that. And understanding we all have different experiences of the student and all are valid. Yeehaw. Exactly. Um, and look, you know, as I said, there's a diversity of teachers out there. Some of them you need to actually do a little bit more prompting and give them a bit more guidance in understanding exactly what you have said. Um, sometimes I think it's easier for those teachers who are parents themselves, but not necessarily. We have some brilliant young teachers and old teachers without kids who do have that concept and, and can understand different points of view. So thanks everyone for those little comments there and I'll hand it back over to Lindy. Well, actually it's still you because you're going to be the principal. <laughs> yeah. well, this is something we did because this often happens, you know, like, uh, we say things as, as teachers or principals or hoses and we're not realising what we're saying and the effect that actually can have on parents. So we've just got a few slides along that vein at first. So as a principal, I, you might hear this. Have, have you thought about going back to work? She thinks I'm an anxious mother with too much time on my hands. 
So continue, Fiona. <laughs> okay, so as a teacher aide, and through, through concern, it said, oh, she was really tired when she came in this morning. Yep, we never go out because of her difficulties with fatigue. We never do the things other families do. When we do, you have a go at me. You're telling me off. And so it's also the way this it's said, isn't it? You know, like I could say that she's really tired when she came in this morning, or I could be saying it as a very concerned teacher aide, but the interpretation of the parent is really not what I think about necessarily when we're saying these things. So his teacher aide reads with him. I have 29 other children in the class to think about. And I'm always horrified when I read that one. But yeah. <laughs> the, the teacher doesn't see my child as her responsibility. You're not entitled to a Rolls Royce service. We have limited resources that we must allocate fairly. You are a greedy, pushy, selfish parent. I know he's lashing out, but that is what children with autism do. You don't see my son. You don't recognise him as an individual. Um, uh, it's Mrs Smith on the phone. Are you in? The, the whole office thinks I'm a problem. Um, and I think that's, that's one particularly where, um, I mean, if any of us heard that, that's exactly how you would feel because often getting in, like making that phone call, you're already in a situation where you're already feeling like, like everyone's seeing you that way. Um, but the reality may be that the principal takes what you're ringing about seriously and just needs, knows that, that um, they don't have the time right now. They're running off to, you know, something else or they've got something else they need to do. Um, so, but this is just, you know, so someone once said, you know, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't the receptionist know how to use the, the, um, the hold button? <laughs> Okay, so basically what we've done is sort of reversed it. Um, so we've consulted with teachers and Fiona has had input here as well as other teachers that we know um, who do value having children um, of all abilities in their classroom. Um, but basically to sort of help parents see what, you know, might be said and that teachers may receive it in, in a, a particular way. So the parent says, at your school, some of the children with disabilities are getting bullied. Oh, you don't value any of the work I've been doing on positive behaviour support. Have you followed up on the changes of my son's ICP that we talked about at the meeting? His parent doesn't think I'm doing my job properly or working hard enough. I will bring in all of my research on Fragile X Syndrome. Huh. She doesn't think I have the skills or care enough about her son for me to do my own research. I want to discuss my child's progress in the first week of school. You don't think I'm teaching your kid properly? I want to know how you're planning for my child's individual needs. That's parents already decided that I'm a teacher who doesn't see all children as individuals. My child is autistic. You will need to give him breaks, provide everything visual, don't overwhelm him, make sure he has friends, don't make him angry, don't be loud. Oh, stop, stop, yeah, stop. yeah, yeah, yeah. This parent doesn't think I know anything about teaching children with autism. I've had one in my class every day for the last <laughs> five years. And look, um, and I think, you know, like having said that, like there is a lot of supports that I certainly ask for for my daughter. Um, and I've certainly given and probably overwhelmed teachers with a massive list of things. And she does need, you know, quite a number of things. If, 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 if there aren't quite a few things in place, um, things can go wrong pretty fast. So, um, so it is important, but it's, I think, all about how you prioritise the information, how you communicate that. So uh, this is um, this is from understood.org, which is a wonderful resource site. Uh, and it's eight sentence starters to use when talking to teachers. The first one is, could you help me to understand? So it's taking the curious approach as to why something might have happened or why something might have occurred, rather than making an assumption and starting um, from there as, you know, why did... Yeah. What was the goal of the assignment? So this sort of question leads to possibly some creative problem solving. So if you can have an understanding as a parent 
of what is supposed to be achieved via the assignment, then knowing your child best, you might be able to figure out an alternative way for your child to, to meet the same goal. It seems if she has a harder time doing such and such when such and such. So um, it's a non-judgmental way of introducing an idea rather than just sort of assuming that the, pair, that the teacher should have already done it because it was written in the IEP or whatever. Um, it's more of a, you know, just trying to actually get the problem solved. I've noticed something that works for my child is when, could there be opportunities for that to happen in class? Have you considered, or I am wondering if? So those sorts of ideas just get um, some, well, some, get some ideas actually happening and bringing um, teachers on board. Her ILP, so that's like an IEP or a personalized learning plan or whatever the document is that you meet with your school to develop um, the supports and adjustments for your child. Um, her ILP provides her with whatever it is, whatever the support or adjustment, how does it actually look in the classroom? And for me, that's more now high school level. So it might be, um, this is in her IEP. Uh, how does that look like in science? How does that look like in English? And how can I help or support what you are trying to achieve? So uh, I think all of us actually receive um, uh, an approach from others uh, where, where it actually looks like they're trying to help us um, and, and that's a good place to start a collaborative relationship. So there's certainly challenges in building partnerships in schools. Um, schools, well, school systems do lack time to prioritise relationships. Um, teachers have a lot of students, they have a lot of demands that are outside schooling, paperwork and meetings and that sort of thing um, that actually takes away from um, student focus and certainly focus on developing partnerships. So um, it's, you know, even if a, if a teacher actually is very keen and, you know, realises that a parent's involvement is crucial, um, they may have limited time um, and capacity to be able to make that actually work. Everyone brings different assumptions and histories to the relationship. Uh, we've all been to school. Um, we've all had our own experiences at school. Uh, certainly, th there's many parents who did not have great uh, experiences at school who then struggle to actually advocate for their children because just simply walking into the office brings a whole lot of baggage with it. Um, there are also situations where teachers or principals or school staff have actually had their own negative experiences as well. So that is something to really think about and, and keep in perspective. Parents need the relationship to work more than teachers. So we have this in there because at the end of the day, um, we as parents have, we will be the ones, we will be the last man standing when our children are finished at school, we will still be here and we will deal with the consequences or the, you know, the positive outcomes or whatever there is um, of their school career and, and what they can go on to do. So um, school staff tend to only have limited relationships with our children. We are here forever. So that is important to remember and, and have some authority in, but at the same time, um, use it wisely. Families can already feel marginalised or disempowered, and that's really common. And, and we've heard that in the chat about sort of not having our view taken seriously. Um, there does tend to, and we can already feel um, quite nervous um, because we're dealing with professionals and, um, and we, we might not feel validated as parents and that our experience is just not quite um, as important. Accumulation of issues and hurts can lead to reactive rather than strategic advocacy. So we might have actually held on to things for a while and then, um, you know, it's like the straw that broke the camel's back, all of a sudden uh, it, it, there's a bit of an explosion. So we need to be very conscious of where we get to and we make sure that we don't let little things build up to big things. There are tensions between being vigilant and micromanaging. And I myself, and I'm sure plenty of other parents have had situations like this, you're never quite, you, you, you're not sure of, is this a little thing? Is this something I should take care of now before it becomes a big thing? Or, you know, am I, is it, you know, am I just emailing way too much? 
Um, am I not doing it enough? Um, so yeah, it's, it is a bit of a balance. Um, I'm not sure if there's any magical answer, but it's something I think as parents, it's nice to just sort of know that other parents feel that way too. And there are challenges in knowing when to speak up. So that's sort of covered in a lot of the other points, but um, I think we all also can struggle, many of us can struggle with having the confidence to speak up. Um, with, you know, we don't want to rock the boat. And I think that tends to be the sense of most um, parent advocates. So that brings us to embracing your natural authority as a family member. So if you do feel like you lack a bit of confidence, um, take it from other parent advocates who have gone before that it is, it helps you stand your ground and realize that you are, um, uh, you are the most important person in your child's life and you, this is your job. So you can put your advocacy hat on um, and embrace it as your role. Um, and this is a quote of Margaret Wards, who um, is a wonderful parent advocate whose daughter went through school many years ago. Um, and she says, make two lists. In the first column, list all the people who have been constant in the life of your son or daughter. In the other column, list all the people who have come and gone over the same period. Your list will likely be short, naming your family members, perhaps a few faithful friends or extended family. These are the people who can even begin to claim some authority in your son or daughter's life. The other list will be enormous and frighteningly irrelevant. And so that's something really, I often try and remember when it comes down to big decisions and big choices where um, schools may have their, their own particular thoughts or views um, based on my daughter's diagnosis or, or whatever. Um, of what you know should be done or what you know decisions should be made and I come back to that you know and, and it helps helps you to have those uncomfortable conversations so what helps you become a valued and effective partner establish how you will communicate so whether that be by email phone um, how regularly um, Establish that, particularly at the start of the year, um, but don't be afraid to change it if you need to. Um, you need to feel comfortable and you also need to, um, you know, that's a good way of showing teachers and schools that you are willing to be a partner. There is no um, right amount of contact, but it's, it's, it's totally negotiable and will constantly change according to the people in the situation and how your child's going. Don't agree straight away if unsure. That's a very, very important um, point to take home. If you just don't know, then it's okay to say, I need some time to think about it. Can you give me a few days? Can I get back to you in a few days? Don't ambush the school. This, I, I really like this point and I think it is something that some, uh, most parents would not do this until they get to a point of absolute frustration. And I think it's really important as parent advocates for us to actually recognise when we're getting to that point. Um, and that's where, you know, being connected with others is, is really important to sort of help you from, help you recognise that you're getting to that point and, and be more strategic. Use the formal processes and don't escalate unwisely. Always know that if you do escalate, there will always be a consequence. Um, and so make sure that you have used every other avenue possible to you before you actually go further, because I think we all know um, in any of our relationships, if you go above people's heads and things, or people haven't, if you haven't actually gone through the formal conflict resolution processes or complaint processes, um, it doesn't do well for relationships. Do take the curious approach. We, you know, talked about that before. Try not to assume that something has happened. Um, and look, it may have happened because of prejudice or lack of understanding. Um, but don't assume that every single time and actually try to take the, the curious approach. And even if it has happened for, from, you know, a lack of understanding or um, some, you know, views are a bit outdated, it's still not going to help you solve the problem if, uh, if you react emotively. And, and I know how hard it is to not react emotively when you're talking about your child, but it is important to keep things in perspective. Solve problems by thinking creatively. Um, and so inclusion is really about creativity. 
Uh, we didn't grow up ourselves in inclusive um, schooling systems. Um, we, so we, we all have to actually think outside the box. Here's a, um, a great quote from Matt's mum. Um, don't try to micromanage the school. It will end badly. Catch the big fish. Don't complain about everything you are unhappy about. And um, I, I like learning from other parent advocates who, have, who are further along than me. Um, I think that way I save myself a lot of grief <laughs> and time consuming um, work and actually get my child a better education by actually learning from what other parents have learned. Here's another great quote, being prepared for meetings and thinking about what information I can provide about Sophie has been really important. I have mostly found teachers very open to my input, but I do try to be well prepared to keep an eye on what I want from the process for Sophie and also modeling a positive approach. So that means, you know, if, if everything starts going a bit negative and bit deficit, um, uh, steering, you know, towards deficits, um, we as parents can actually turn it around to talk about um, uh, positives, uh, you know, interests and, and um, gifts and strengths. So here's Mother of Sophie saying, it took a while for me to break the habit of focusing on Sophie's limits, but while I don't deny the challenges, I do see my role as keeping the broader picture in view that Sophie is a student with the same need to participate, learn, have friends and be challenged. So some very wise words there. So I'm gonna pass back to Fiona now for some great skill building. Okay, so um, this section just talks about building your skills for more effective communication and collaboration. And I'm sure that you're all quite aware of these three different ways of communicating. And aggressive communication doesn't help at all, especially if you're starting from that point. I do understand that we can end up at that point when we're feeling very frustrated, but ultimately it's not going to help anyone. So you've got to think about, take a step back. There's no point going into a school feeling aggressive because the, the, the school will just have barriers up towards you. They'll work together to make sure you're not particularly heard because you're one of those aggressive parents and they will cut you off and they won't acknowledge what you're trying to say, which could be of so much value for them as a school, but when they're feeling attacked, they're not going to even listen to you. The other one you've got to avoid is being too passive, like you know, letting the, the school and the um, teachers just say, oh, look, I think this is the best for your child. And you may not feel that way, but you just agree because it just seems easier to agree. But just remember, it's really important for you to actually um, be a little bit assertive, which of course is the next one, because the teacher may not realize where you're actually coming from. I guess it's really important for you as parents to make sure that when you go, you know Know what you want and you're not going to present that information which will make that teacher feel either attacked or that they can walk all over you. Okay so yeah that's just validating what we were saying and hopefully giving you a few more tips to follow on them and just to keep coming back to the importance to build up that relationship with the teacher and the school and doing so in a way that actually the teacher also will want to have a good relationship with you so just come from that point of view to start off with. So those statements, they're made up and I am aware of time. So we did start a little bit late. So we will go to about 10 past. So hopefully you'll be able to stay online till then. So I statements are made up of those four parts. Like I feel, I think, um, taking responsibility for your own feelings. When I see my daughter experiencing, so st stating the situation, because what is it about the situation or consequence you don't like? I would really like if, and offering that preferred or, or alternative or compromise. Now below here, I've just got some examples that parents have shared with us. Um, I feel worried when I see that my son is withdrawn from the classroom for one-on-one -on -one support because I fear that he will be seen differently and become less connected to his peers. And this is one of the things that comes up regularly. So how you actually say that will make the difference for those teachers in going, oh, okay, I never really thought that. I thought we were doing the right thing for your child. Remember, teachers hopefully are coming from that perspective. 
I would really like his support to be provided in the regular class and in a way that connects to his classmates and, and preserves his identity as an independent learner. So some of the tips, and as we keep saying, planning is the key to so many things in our lives. It's made it very hard for us all of a sudden to go online. So planning for conversations that are online is even trickier. And there was a comment in chat about that. Um, but still, you need to plan that conversation. Relate back to that inclusive vision. So why do you want to, a particular thing to happen for your child? What is about this, what's happening now you don't agree with? So think about your vision and use some of those sense starters. And it's also, I just, you know, we come back with our own children, you know, some fights aren't worth fighting, you know, or some things aren't worth doing. And it's a bit like that sometimes at school, like know what are the most key important things you want for your child and fight for those. Some of those other little things, yep, it'd be great if they happen and it'd be a bonus. But if you go fighting for every single thing, then you might not, be able to achieve the key things. So know what those key things are for you that you want for your child within that inclusive environment and be able to plan that conversation to have with the teacher by using some of those sentence starters. So, um, uh, so this is a bit of a summary slide really of what we've um, covered. Um, and we'll go a little bit more on the opportunities of the fact that we're actually, you know, many of us are still going to be schooling at home for a little bit longer. Um, and have been schooling from home for quite a while, <laughs> for quite a few weeks. So, um, but yeah, focusing on a small number of things you want to change. And um, there's actually a little video later where I think I say that. Um, that has certainly helped um, in my advocacy um, when I feel like there's a lot of things going on. Um, using your vision to prioritise and make that priority list and clarify what's important. And we do, we, we um, dealt a lot more with vision um in workshop one and um, i think webinar one um has um, a bit of that as well because when we talked about transitions uh um, but again we've got that wonderful web resource um up now so um look for that using your vision um part of our website to have a look for worksheets and resources on on developing a vision and using it um, thinking strategically about who can make changes and how they may be open to your messages. So who do you need to talk to? Um, who might be open to what you're asking for? Take your time to plan, obviously, rather than being reactive most of the time. Every now and then there is something that happens where you probably need to bring it up straight away. Um, but those times don't happen too often. So just um, uh, most of the time you actually have the time to plan. Draw upon a support network. So um, family, friends um, and your peer supports, um, other parents who also understand and are pursuing inclusive education for their children are probably your best resources. Um, knowing you can't influence everything, but you can contribute to building a positive school culture. Uh, now, a bit of a home activity that you might like to do um, is thinking about the sort of the, the who, what, where type questions of a uh, conversation you might like to have at school, um, that you a change that you would like to see in your child's school day. Um, I believe we have sent through, um, in the email, there might have been attached a one page document um, with those sorts of questions. Um, if it hasn't, we'll send it through in a follow up email. Um, now, obviously a lot of stuff is happening by email at the moment, a lot of our communication. Um, this is uh, Oscar's mum's um, advice. Um, write an email, but don't send it straight away. Address it to yourself so it doesn't go to the school. The next day when you have calmed down, read it again. And if you need to, make it less confrontational and seeking a cooperative approach to address the issue. This has worked really well for me. I get my anger out in the email, but I don't send it for another day or two until I have calmed down. Um, obviously, other ways um, are getting... Um, a friend to look at it. I wouldn't. <laughs> Sometimes your husband is not the best person to check your emails if your husband feels just as passionately or more so than you do. So you know, get get a person you know who can actually look at it um, a bit more objectively. 
um, to do a bit of a screen before you send off um, a, a, an email dealing with something serious that you know is emotive for you. Um, another way of thinking about it is using the BIF framework. Um, so that's brief, informative, friendly, but firm. So keeping it brief, getting to the point, being informative, um, being friendly, um, but being very clear about what you're wanting and what the issue is. Some opportunities um, that some parents have noticed that they um, uh, and, and can take um, at these times of remote learning at home, um, take advantage of these opportunities, is developing a better understanding of the curriculum. And I, I've certainly experienced that um, with my year 10 girl. I know a lot more about the curriculum now than I did a few weeks ago. So that, that can't, but, you know, that can't be anything but good um, when she gets back into, into school. Um, it definitely has been giving us all a chance to learn more about how our child engages best um, with learning. Um, my daughter has been, you know, sort of dragged through it, I think, a little bit by me um, because I have been concerned about her, particularly she's in year 10 and um, she's doing, you know, choosing subjects for next year and that sort of thing. Um, so I have had to make sure that adjustments are happening and that she is engaging in the way that actually works for her um, so that we can both get through this um, having a great relationship together. So um, that and, and that will actually um, serve well for me to plan my conversations with the school when she goes back. It has definitely been an opportunity to, to notice further interests and strengths. Um, and she has just started um, doing a um, crystal competition. So her interest is in science and she started growing crystals, which is fantastic. Um, so that's something new. Um, she's also joining a signing choir. Uh, so she was never a fan of the noisy choirs, <laughs> but, but, um, but a signing choir will probably go very well. So that's something exciting and another opportunity for her in school. Um, and gaining insight into adjustments or lack of that are actually needed. Um, it's been, uh, it's obviously been a real eye opener, I think, for many parents to see what is actually happening for their children um, and the adjustments that aren't being delivered from the IEPs or the ILPs. So um, Fiona's going to take over with this slide. Of course, we need that kindness and empathy within the advocacy role. Like teachers are struggling as well at the moment and pedalling really fast underwater, I think. Um, so it's really important we have that empathy as they should have for you because you guys are also struggling with this changed environment for learning. I guess the thing I like to keep reminding a lot of people that I've talked to, academic learning is one part of our learning. Your children are still learning some of those skills of resilience of boredom, of actually not wanting to be on a computer anymore and want to go and play outside, of having to interact with siblings and having to interact as the family day in and day out. So although they might not be doing some of the academic things, you might be thinking of really the most important things in the world. Treating people with well is usually the best pass. Yeah, without a doubt. I don't think I need to say anything there. It's just the way it is. A solution focus. Yes, we really like that. So if you come to us, if, if I'm in the teaching field and you go, look, I'd really like to think that, you know, this is something that's working from home. I'm wondering if it can work at school because now you've had that opportunity of working at home, you might pick up strategies that the teacher hasn't had that opportunity to see because they have got their classroom full of students. So share those solutions with them. And yeah, as I just said, they're feeling overwhelmed too. And um, that contacting is the hardest thing, you know, like they're now sort of sitting there and every bit of assessment that comes in, they've got to mark and do things with, but they realize that the most important thing is keeping that relationship with their child and with you. So just, fit, just be patient with them as well at this point in time. And relationships, as we always know, still matter even more when the conversation's happening online. So keeping on track, and this is me as well. Firstly, I'd like to say that this is one of our parents who I believe she's online at the moment. So hopefully I do it justice. So her vision for her son was to live a life filled with learning, joy and companionship, to feel productive, included and valued each and every day. 
And that's such a great vision. And so whenever she goes to the school or whatever she's doing, if she comes back to thinking, yeah, that's my goal, that's what I want to achieve. So keep coming back to that vision, noting what the key hope for Will is at the time. And at the moment, it's for him to have that smooth transition back to school. So how can I help that process? Note what's most likely required for this to be achieved. So being calm yourself and providing that supportive environment over the next few weeks. So I know that grade kindy and ones are already in there with 11s and 12s today. Um, I did talk at a, the Zoom meeting the other day with one of the participants who's here. Have a mock, you know, go back to school. If they're going back on the Monday, maybe on the Friday, pretend to go through the whole sequence and, you know, including packing their lunches and taking them to school if you have got that relationship with if they're getting picked up from someone at the front gate if you're not able to if they're not a child you can just drop off ask the school if they can pre-arrange that on the Friday so the child has that feeling of going through it all so if you can take the time and how create that opportunity to do a mock day it will certainly help you your son or daughter to transition back after this um, online learning keeping them positive in regards to learning and finding ways to connect with classmates. Now, this is just a couple minutes of advocacy tips from um, current parent advocates here in Queensland. Um, and I do think that's always the best way to learn is to learn from others. First of all, I like to reinforce the positives, uh, what they're doing great for our family and for my son, and then go into and acknowledge the staff that have been involved in that, if that's relevant, and then bring up, you know, the most pertinent points that I really want to talk about. I have used myself um, the, the principles around non-violent communication when I think of my interactions um, in advocacy you know, situations. So thinking clearly about the preferred outcome I would like from the interaction and also the non-violent communication principles, which are really about weighing your words and choosing the words you use, understanding that they can either contribute to connection or to distance. If it's a problem as such, you know, work towards a solution, asking them their ideas, you know, using the curious approach to, to draw them in to, to ask them why and what they see it might be some solutions. I would never go to any meeting at school on my own. Uh, it, is all, it is so helpful to have another person with me um, who understands the situation and also cares deeply for Liam. And plan, plan before you have those conversations. Um, go in with a goal and stick to that goal and keep coming back to that goal until you can actually get there and find a solution. One thing I found useful with the school was to give them one or two guiding principles to help them make decisions when situations are a bit more complex. So when they're not sure if they should do this or that, one of the guiding principles is not to take my son out of class and into the educational um, unit. Um, so I say, you know, let's find a solution that you would find for any child without a disability. What would you do? You would not take him away from class or what can we do that, um, that doesn't entail that strategy? Okay, the home activity, the individual reflection. So we all, we sent everyone who, um, with the Zoom link, that little questionnaire to promote you to think about some of the things you can do before your meeting. And some of the things um, to add on to that is, what is one unhelpful habit you wanna give up? So as a parent, I meant, it's not only as a parent, as an individual, we all have some little habits and we think, oh, that's not so good. I mean, in an ideal world, if you've got a partner or a friend who can go, well, you know what, you go in there and you put your hands on your hips straight away. And that's a sign that you're going to be um, conversing in a way that might be a little bit more aggressive than you need to. So something when you're looking for an unhelpful habit, sometimes it's good to ask a friend or a partner what they would uh, say is one of your unhelpful habits. But more importantly, what's a helpful habit? Ones that I like to think and build upon. So think about those things. Uh, one tricky conversation that you need to rehearse for and uh, one thing you could communicate that you want to improve and that's really important because it's not um, in the sense of how you, how you do communicate to them in the sense of the way you want something to improve but also what is the communication partnership between the two of you that needs to be improved too. So there's two aspects to that. 
And what's one thing I can do to keep learning and developing my skills? So look, even that little video we just watched as an example, there's a lot of information online about communication and strategies to support that. So take a, do a little bit of research and um, you'll, I'm sure you'll find things that will support you and help. But it's always good if you have the opportunity and you have someone you can actually bounce ideas off, then that often helps. And I do keep promoting this, but if you do want to talk to crew staff, in, if you're preparing for one of those difficult meetings, please feel free to converse with us. Yeah, okay. Well, do you want to talk to that and I'll look at the chats? Yep, yep. So, yeah, awesome. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so this is um, John's mum. Um, and she says, the best advice I can give is to stay connected to people who value your goals and who will support you in pursuing your dreams. For me, knowing other parents who were choosing inclusion and were a little further down the track has been gold. Uh, and here in Queensland, um, we are very fortunate to have the Queensland Collective for Inclusive Education as a peer support network. Um, and they have a website, qcie.org, uh, and they have a Facebook group if you look for Queensland Collective for Inclusive Education Peer Support Network. I think it's called Peer Support Network, QCIE or something, but. You can, you can find it, uh, more details on qcie.org. Um, and that's all parents. It's all parents who are advocating for their children now for an inclusive education, um, plus some highly valued past um, advocates as well. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so top tips for school partnerships, clarify your vision, practice sharing your child's strengths, um, rather than uh, um, diagnosis and deficit type language. And there is a video um, that I've done on that and that's available on our crew website as well. Um, learning about inclusive education and what it is, um, plan everything, document what you want, anticipate the challenges. Make sure you rehearse those conversations. Like the video said, predict what you think the response might be and already have planned a response to the response you probably know you're going to get. Um, connect with peer support to hear positive stories. Um, knowing inclusion is possible will help if um, will help you to be a stronger advocate. Um, knowing other families and other children who are being included at the moment, knowing what's possible certainly helps you ask for something and feel strong in that. And finally, a, a lovely um, quote from Kate's mother. At the end of the year, she, who was the teacher, was as teary as we were, so grateful for the opportunity to learn. She left the school sometime after, but became a strong advocate for inclusion at a different school. It seemed testament to the importance of being prepared as a family to hang in there while people learn. And I think that's really important to remember that it is a pretty steep learning journey for many. And, um, and those of us uh, who, who do have family members with disability, um, we are very much leaders in our own lives, um, in our own schools. So um, hang in there and do keep dreaming that you're actually influencing others um, slowly but surely. Okay, so finally we are up to question time. I will close the recording. There's been some great comments on chats like, you know, they, the, the liking the first sentence, could you help me to understand? Um, people wanting to have a little bit of understanding how they get through the teacher and get through that system of the hods and hoses, et cetera. Um, how important it is the child's relationship with the teacher. And at times you have to bite your lip and realize that, well, that's the most important, which was highlighted by someone on that chat. Um, the challenges every year going through the same processes, the comments about the ILP and the updates. Um, please, whenever you're updating a plan with a teacher or a hose or whoever, just remember what you're looking for is the next steps. It's not just going, oh yeah, we've done that or oh, where are we going now? So within that planning, when they say there's an update meeting, think about, well, you know, okay, they have achieved some of this, they have not achieved some of this, but where do I want to go to next? So when they sort of call you in for a meeting, have those things um, aligned in your head so you can um, express them clearly to the staff. Mm -hmm.